I am reading from Luke chapter 4 and verses 1 to 15. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. I want you to go quickly to several portions of Scripture, the first of them being Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 8 and 9. And you will quickly find that the focus or the theme of these portions which I have pulled out is to do with our adversary, the devil. And let me underscore that the devil is not either our friend or any kind of a neutral. He is our adversary. Peter says, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. I suspect that either in real life or by means of video that we have all seen either a lion or another animal stalking another animal. How that they crouch down, how that there is that looking for that key moment of attack, an opportunity where the other, the victim, is vulnerable. And that is just precisely the moment when the attack is made. We are told that the devil is just of this sort. He is prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He isn't particularly concerned about who it is, but he is constantly hungry. He is constantly looking for prey. Peter says, resist him. Jesus resisted him in the desert, in the wilderness. We are told also, resist him. How? Firm in your faith. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 talked about that full suit of armor that we are to take up and the weapons of our warfare. We are to resist firm in our faith. And Peter says, You know that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Now, on the one hand, that could refer to the physical sufferings, the deprivations which they were enduring, the, the jobs that they had lost, the property which had been taken from them because they no longer went to the temples as the rest of the pagan friends and family members that they associated with before. But especially it has to do with the devil's tricks and temptations. Resist him, knowing that you are not alone 
in what is taking place. So we have heard from Peter. Let's hear from the Apostle Paul. We go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Paul says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. There is nothing new under the sun. The devil has his favorite bag of tricks which has worked for him for hundreds and even thousands of years. And he continues to use that very toolbox against believers. And Paul, lest there be a pride that comes upon these Corinthian believers or any believers, he says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common and has been used many times. Lest you say, oh, I am sorely oppressed by the devil and some pride comes alive and you think that the devil is especially concerned about getting you as a trophy to mount and to put up on his wall. Don't be so foolish. The devil is prowling around looking for whoever in a moment of weakness, showing vulnerability, that he might snatch and that he might tear. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. But the flip is that though the devil acts in this way, God is faithful. Completely faithful. That is who he is, just as the very character of the devil is to tear and to destroy to prowl around looking for victims. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. He is faithful and when temptation comes in, the Lord, the same God who sent David to fight Goliath and all of the Israelites, they're biting their nails thinking, I don't think this is a good idea. If he goes down, we all go down with him. That was the bargain. We don't think this is a good idea. The same God who sent David into that battle knowing that he was more than able to best that giant, he is the same one who will watch over you and guard you against what you are not able to endure. In the book of Job, we read at the outset, Satan came before the Lord, and Job, or rather Satan complains about how that God has set a hedge, a barrier around Job, and he's treated Job too well. But that if only God would remove a little bit of that and let him through, open, open, give him an opportunity, then Job would curse God to his face. God has a hedge not just around Job, but around each and every one of us as well. And with the temptation, we're all acquainted with exit signs in buildings that we frequent. And we know where to go should fire break out or some emergency demand that we get out as fast as possible. God is just as smart. Oh, he's smarter than any building inspector or any building planner. And he has made for the believer a way of escape so that we can endure it. So we've heard from Peter and we've heard from Paul. Let's hear through the pen of the Apostle John now. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, familiar words, Jesus said, the thief, and here he is most certainly addressing who the devil is, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What is that? It's a scorched earth policy. It is to burn and to destroy that nothing of value be left. The thief comes and what he can't steal, he kills. What he can't kill, he absolutely obliterates so that it is 
worthless. The thief coming to steal, kill, destroy Jesus. Again, this complete reversal. Jesus has come that there might be life and that there might not simply be a life of a comatose body breathing but nothing more, but that there might be an abundant life in the spiritual realm. The devil, he steals, he kills, he destroys. He is a thief, he is a murderer, he is bent on destruction. Jesus, completely different. In John chapter 8, and here you will see we're moving in reverse order as the, as the New Testament is laid out. In John chapter 8 and verse 44 now, Jesus is dialoguing with some people and you can understand that they're not very happy with him in the words that he speaks. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. What are the desires of the devil? Steal, kill, destroy. And Jesus is saying, your desires line up perfectly with the desires of your father, the devil. And Jesus gives, as it were, a Reader's Digest, compacted, condensed summary of who the devil is. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. My first language, and essentially my only language, though I have dabbled in a few others, and for about five seconds can trick people into thinking I know more than I do, my first language is English. It is the language that I'm sure that when I, when I talk in my sleep, as I embarrassingly do at times, when I talk in my sleep, I don't speak a word of Bulgarian or of Cree or of anything else. I, I couldn't come up with a single word if my life depended on it in those languages. Now the devil, when he speaks a lie, he speaks from that first, that primary language, which just naturally comes out of him. And Jesus is saying, this is the kind, this is who the devil is and what he does. In Revelation, which of course came from the pen of the apostle John, Revelation chapter 19 we come to the fourfold hallelujah. And in verses 5 and 6, we read, And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah. Let me stop right there. Many Christians look at the book of Revelation and seriously wonder at the wisdom of God that this would be how our Bibles would conclude. There is fear in hearts. There is trembling. There is wondering, why do we have to hear all of this at the very end after hearing such wonderful stories of Jesus and of his love? The New Testament Christians in the first century and in successive centuries looked at Revelation and they joined together in verse 6 of chapter 19 with what is said, Hallelujah! For the Lord, the Omnipotent, reigns. The Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Revelation is the account of the devil who does his absolute best his most dastardly work in order to grab a hold of what he has usurped and to hold it. And it is the account of him being trodden underfoot and that he is a defeated foe. And so the, the 
Christians of the New Testament, they heard this and they went right on. We are on the winning side. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world who has constantly ever dogged our tracks. Hallelujah. And we need to join together with them in that excitement. Now we come back from the end of the New Testament to a very early part, that is, an early part of the life of Jesus, as he has been baptized and the Holy Spirit has descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And there has been that testimony, that witness of his father, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. So Jesus, anointed of the Spirit, and in chapter 4, we begin, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. The question, which often subtly, and perhaps without any people even really thinking about it, is when they are tempted, why? Why is this happening? Have I sinned? Have I grieved the Lord that the devil is so pressing upon me? Understand, here is Jesus, completely sinless, completely without sin. He is specifically led into the wilderness that the devil might have at it with Jesus there for 40 days. You recall in the Exodus, the children of Israel had witnessed the ten plagues which God had placed upon the Egyptians and with just the, 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 the most reluctance, Pharaoh had let the people go. And the people, they go out into the wilderness and what happens? They come up against the Red Sea and they have nowhere to go and they have... Pharaoh's army coming at them, possibly to destroy at least a portion of them. And what do they say? Oh, thank the Lord that we have such an opportunity to see the power of God working among us. Nothing of the kind. They were in absolute panic, though they had just seen the power of God and how that he had brought them out. And Moses, of course, was absolutely the lowest of low life. He was slime of all slime in their eyes. What did you bring us out here for to die in the wilderness? Don't think that you are out of step with God, that you are under temptation. The devil ever prowling around looking for someone to devour Jesus here, he endured all that we endured that, as Hebrews points out to us, that he might be our faithful and righteous and perfect high priest. And when temptation comes upon us, we need to understand that God is refining us and working in us to cause us to grow. Jesus, full of the Spirit, previously anointed of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, 40 days being tempted by the devil, nothing to eat during those days. And when they had ended, note that phrase, when they had ended. So we are given three of the temptations which Jesus endured, but there were others. They had been going on for 40 days. We don't have a glimpse into all of those. And we might say, oh, if only, if only in my whole life there had just been three temptations. Let the devil do his best. But if there was boop, 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 and, and if I could just get it over with and, and just hold on and, and just pucker up my faith and, and get others to pray Jesus had been tempted for 40 days of the devil, and here we have a glimpse into three 
First of all, Jesus becomes hungry, understandable. I become hungry after four hours, not 40 days. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Easy for you to do. You made the stars. You made it all. I was there. I saw what you did. It was pretty incredible. But just here, just a little bit of miraculous power is all we need. Turn this stone into bread. You'll be satisfied and we'll all go home happy. Jesus answered, he goes to the scriptures. It is written. It is written. Again, pause right there, please. Who could have written scripture here, right at this point, better than Jesus? Jesus doesn't take pen in hand and say, okay, well, we're going to write something in, that applies to this opportunity. He goes to the word of God, honoring the word of God, which had been given hundreds of years before. And he says, man shall not live on bread alone. The answer that saints in the Old Testament rightly gave when the devil came and tempted them. This world is not all there is. And we shall live on God's word, not on bread alone. What if Jesus had said, oh, yeah, devil, you know what? I never thought of that. That's something that just never occurred to me. You've got me there. And now I need to write out some new, clever little bit. No, Jesus, he, he writes, or he directs rather to the Old Testament. If he had not, I think he would have had to apologize to those Old Testament saints saying, look, I left you vulnerable at this point. I didn't, didn't give you an appropriate answer or covering for how the devil might try to attack you. There was a chink in your armor where he could have gotten through. Jesus honors the word of God and he holds it up. The second temptation especially catches my attention. The devil takes Jesus and shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And I have this huge panoramic screen in my mind where there was the Egyptian empire and there was the per Babylonian and there was the Medo-Persian and there was the Greek and the Roman and so many and not just in that little part of the world, in China and in the Americas and in Africa. Kingdoms that have risen and fallen. Kingdoms that were outstanding in their splendor. And the devil comes to him and he shows him in a moment of time all of these things. And he says to him, I will give you all this domain. I will give this to you and its glory. For it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Do you realize that if a liar is to cause confusion, he cannot always tell a lie? If the devil is to cause confusion to us, sometimes he needs to speak truth, and at other times a lie, in order that we go, well, which voice do I listen to? I think that was right. I think that... And we're confused. And we need to hold on to the word of God. The devil comes and there are some things that are true and some things that are false. The devil says to him, I will give this to you and its domain and its glory. Now, it would have been for a moment. Let's admit it right outright. Sin has fun and pleasure, but it is only for the briefest moment. And then there is the anguish. There is the sorrow that comes thereafter. So the devil says to him, look, you can have this domain and its glory. The, the glory of some of the kingdoms had already faded. For it has been handed over to me. Who had handed it over to him? We had. Our fingerprints were on it. And we had handed it over to him in the Garden of Eden when we had listened to the lie of the devil rather than to the truth of God. We said, yes, okay, here, you take we, we had been given the authority over this world and we handed it over to the devil. And Jesus said, I will give it to whomever I wish. 
just fall down. Worship before me and it'll be yours. Jesus knew that was a lie. That the only way to deal with the devil was through the blood that would be shed upon Calvary's cross. Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil then leads Jesus up onto the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem and says to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. And the devil adds in scripture. Now, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. They, on their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Go ahead, throw yourself down. It'll be okay. Nothing, nothing bad will happen. Jesus answered and said to him, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him. How wonderful to have the devil leave us. But then there is that phrase, until an opportune time. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 says, Do not, do not, do not give the devil an opportunity. The devil left him until an opportune time. He would be back. And how foolish we are if we think, he won't be back to try to devour us as well once again. But greater, greater, greater is he that is in you. We know our adversary. We are aware of his devices and his tricks. But we need not fear him because of Jesus Christ. Lord, we rejoice in you, and we give you thanks and praise for all of your goodness. May our hearts be set upon you and upon your word, which is our covering, our shield, our protection against all the devices and tricks and schemes of the devil. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.